refines us and strengthens. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want to tell you a story about a young man named Bill. There's not many Bills in here. <laughs> I heard this story a couple of years ago, a pastor was sharing. I don't remember the college that Bill went to. Bill was a, was a psychology major, young, young man, and, and he had just recently uh, given his life to the Lord. And, and, and on this campus, there was this uh, Methodist church, very prestige Methodist church. Um, I mean, pretty large Methodist church. I mean... Guys showed up every week, three piece suits, women had dresses, and uh, that type of thing. And, and Bill was a, a little bit different. A young man that entered college and uh, tattoos and had some piercings. And, and so th th this church uh, had been desiring to reach into the college community. Uh, they really wanted to have some kind of ministry in, into the young people. And, and one Sunday, Bill decided that he wanted to come over and, and visit the church. And so Bill shows up and he walks into the church and it's full of people and, and everyone's dressed pretty pretty nice. And, and Bill, though, Bill shows up and, and Bill has tattoos, his short sleeve shirt on, and he has a couple piercings, and he's wearing no shoes. And uh, Bill's a little different. But guess what? Bill loves Jesus. And so Bill walks into the church, and it's full, and so he's trying to find a seat, and so he begins to walk down the center aisle. I mean, that's like, the alarm detectors are beeping off now, because now Bill's entering into, like, oh, watch out, everyone's eyes are turning down the middle. This is And so people kind of watch, and, and Bill makes his way down to the front of the, uh, of the sanctuary, and the only place he could sit was on the floor in front of the first pew. So what does Bill do? He sits in front of the church on the floor. Well, one of the gentlemen in the church that had been in the church a very long time, a very well, well to do gentleman, uh, everyone knew him, stands up and everyone begins to think, oh man, he's going to let him do it. He, he, he's going to give it to him and, and tell him he needs to get out. And he begins to walk down the middle of the aisle to and everyone's eyes are like, oh man, everyone's looking up here like, what's going to happen? That older gentleman walks down to the front and sits down on the floor next to him for the entire worship service. And I heard that story for the first time. It really deals and dives into this installment of today's series, One Another, and what it means. Paul uses this word, what it means to accept uh, welcome or embrace. Different words are used in the Greek in Romans chapter 15, verse 7. But this, this really captures this picture of what it means that in the church, if everyone looks like you and everyone does what you do, it might be a boring church. Because the picture of heaven in Revelation is a picture of diversity. So the reality is, when we talk about the church, and this is what Paul's going to talk about today in Romans chapters 14 and 15, is, is what does it mean to embrace people that are different? This is look like. I remember hearing this one time and it stuck with me. Pastor said, What you teach people, they may forget. But what they observe, they'll remember forever. What you teach people, they may forget. Some of you will leave here today and and uh, you may get something, but by Wednesday you'll forget entirely what we've been talking about today. I'm just being honest, it's true. I talk to 
church folk who leave on Sunday morning and I meet them in the restaurant like, man, what did the preacher preach about? It was good. What was it about? I don't know. Like, dude, you just left an hour ago. You don't remember? Yeah, because you weren't listening. Okay, you were just there. I'm telling you, people will forget what you teach them. But what they observe, you do it. And so that Sunday, when that gentleman made his way down to the front to sit next to a young man named Bill, that taught the whole church more than what that preacher could have said that Sunday morning about accepting or welcoming each other. Jesus did this in his ministry. I, I'm not going to spend too long because I want to get into Romans 14 and 15 with you briefly, but I want you to just see just this one line, I was reading this this morning, and I don't know why it came to it, but it, it just really, it just, I don't know, it hit me, and I, I just said, I, I, I gotta throw this in here. Remember in John chapter 4, when, when Jesus enters into this region called Samaria, and remember, Jews and Samarians are, are, are like oil, and what is it, oil and water, they just vinegar. They just don't mix. Samaria was the, the region people came to, and, and, and they would make, I mean, I mean, they'd go all the way around it just to avoid the people in it. I mean, they would make a journey just so they could avoid these people. And, and so, as Jesus approaches, it says that he had to go through Samaria. And I thought that was pretty significant. And so the disciples lead Jesus there, they go on into town to do something. And so Jesus is sitting there at a well, and he knows who's coming. He knows why he's there. The Samaritan woman comes up. And it, what really threw me through the loop was, was this woman in verse 9 that says she was surprised that Jesus talked to her. Because she knew Jews refused to have anything to do with Samaritan. And that just struck me this morning. It says she was surprised that Jesus talked to her. I often wonder if sometimes people ever feel surprised when they walk into church and people talk to them. Because people outside of church don't want anything to do with them. But then they come to church and people begin to talk, people begin to love on them, and they're surprised. Wow, I did not expect to receive that at church. But you know, that's what church should be, the place where people feel the most welcome. And why is it? It's because Paul says in Romans 15, 7, receive or accept or welcome each other just as Christ accepted you for the glory of God. We embrace, we welcome, we accept each other because it's to the glory of God. Because He did it to us. You know, I want you to think about that just for a minute. What, did it, what does it mean to you when you think that Jesus accepted you just as you were? Jesus, we are so thankful that just as you accepted us so that God would be given glory, that we're called to also welcome, accept, and embrace each other. Because it's in that that we we understand then what it meant for you to accept us while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were each different and still are different. And we may move differently, we may think differently, we may do differently, we may smell differently, we may eat or think or whatever differently, whatever, whatever it is that we maybe do differently. <laughs> What's the same is that all of us were received by Jesus in the same way. And so we need help to understand what, 
What is your word telling us about this receiving one another? Embracing one another. And, and I just pray in these few minutes together as we look at the scriptures that you will help us embrace it. Help us to understand what this looks like and why it's important for the church. We pray this all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Romans 14. There's a lot of scripture here this morning, but we're going to read all of it together. When you look at the life of Jesus, one of the things we notice about his ministry is that he, he found a way to break down those barriers. Um, uh, barriers of appearance or a class or race. <clears throat> Anytime we find Jesus, he's, he's doing something that breaks down some sort of barrier. So that, that people can understand that, that when the Savior came, when Christ came, he came for all people. And so I thought to myself, you know, the church of Jesus, you know, before the book of Acts, the church that Jesus was building in his ministry, man, it was made up of some interesting people tax collectors and sinners. If you do a study on those 12 disciples that he chose as apostles, people, those 12 that stayed close and he, you know, he commissioned. The 12 that, that when John recounts there was this crowd of people that would follow him and in John 6 it says all of a sudden they all left him because they couldn't continue to follow and Jesus turned to his 12 and said, well you stay. These are the 12. Those 12 people they weren't religious background people. They were just the common folk that Jesus is going along and saying, hey, I want you to come with me. Hey, I want you to come with me. And he's just grabbing a, a basketball team that shouldn't be a basketball team. And he says, I'm going to give you guys authority to go do what I'm doing. He didn't want people who were caught up with themselves. He didn't want people who, who had religious backgrounds because he wanted to be able to be open and receive that what he was going to do was going to look different. And so Jesus, uh, you know, he, he demonstrates in his ministry and, and, and what he did to help us understand what Paul's going to teach us here then in Romans 14 and 15. So, so if you're not open, maybe open up to Romans 14. I'm just going to start reading some scripture for you here. And uh, just want to make a few observations. And, and just how do, we, how do we understand the context of relationship with one another and the sense of of accepting. And, and and just to kind of give a, uh, um, I, don't, I don't know what word I'm trying to find, but when that woman that was brought out called an adultery, you remember that story? And they wanted to stone her. And, and so Jesus, uh, you know, he, gets the, the, he gets the crowd away and the little lady's left with Jesus and he says, I don't condemn you. I want you to understand now that that didn't mean Jesus said that I condone what you just did. Jesus wasn't saying to the woman because his people left that it's okay that you committed adultery. No, what he was saying was the people no longer here can sentence you with justice because it took people there to stone her. And since they all left, there was no one left there to stone her. And so Jesus says, so, so do I not hold that against you, but... Go now and send no more. I just want people to, to hear me from the get-go. When we talk about accepting and embracing, Paul's talking about the church. He's talking about how we, when, you know, when, when people come into the church and people get saved. I mean, when, when, when I got saved, I didn't look anything like the people in the church I was going to. I mean, my first Sunday at the church that I grew up in as a Nazarene, I broke the bathroom window and wanted to run away. <laughs> And I broke the window and I just stood there like, oh, what did I just do? And I was like, I gotta run. I can't let them know I did this. But the Holy Spirit wouldn't let me move. So I was just standing there. Hey, back the window. So these people were like, man, we have a new teen in our church. He just broke our bathroom window. What are we gonna do with this guy? You know what they did? They loved on me. 
And I received my call of ministry in that Nazarene church and got plugged into that Nazarene church and God did amazing things to those people in that church. So I didn't look like them. I didn't do things like them. But they welcomed me. That's what Paul's talking about. Let me read to you Romans 14, start at verse 1. Listen to what he says. Accept other believers. Remember, we're talking about the church here. We could talk about unbelievers that come in, and we should welcome unbelievers and, and embrace them as Jesus did. But we're talking about believers this morning. We're, we're talking about people in the church. And he says, accept other believers who are weak in faith. And don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. You know, this is, this is something that we, we see in the church a lot. And that, that new believers come into the church and, and uh, they're not in the same maturity level as you are. And so they're doing things that you're like, man, they shouldn't do that as a believer. And so we, like, kind of right off the bat, then we begin to look at them in a different lens because they don't look like us. And Paul says, accept the weaker believer, even if you don't agree with what they're doing. Why? Well, because that's what... Jesus did to each of us when he died on the cross. We didn't know any better. We didn't know what we should be doing, but Jesus died while we were sinners. And so oftentimes in, in, in the context of believers, we get new believers in, and it says don't argue with them about what they think is right or wrong. Welcome them. For instance, he says, and he gives two examples in Romans 14. He says, the first example, one person believed it's all right to eat anything, but another believer with a sensitive conscience will eat only vegetables. Those who feel free to eat anything must not look down on those who don't. And those who don't eat certain foods must not condemn those who do, for God has what? Accepted them. Now, Paul's talking about Rome, he's talking about the Jews and the Gentiles, and, and, and so in the early church, there was this, and, and it was kind of nasty, you know, the, the, the Jews and the Gentiles began to both come together and make up a church. The Jews have one practice, the Gentiles have a practice, they think this is okay, they think this is okay, this is unacceptable, they shouldn't be doing this, and so Paul's like, let's put them together. <laughs> That's what Jesus came to do, bring together, to, to, to bring Gentile and Jew together and make up the church. Well, well now we've got a church that is, it, it, you know, now they're like, they're arguing and they're disputing, you shouldn't do this, no, you shouldn't do that, you shouldn't eat this, no, you shouldn't eat this, and they're just arguing. So Paul's like, let's stop it! <laughs> it's okay if they do that, it's okay if they do that. Because here's the, here's the reality. What God's Word gives us, what, what God initiates and said, this is what you shouldn't do. And that's what you should be doing. If God's word has said it, if God's word has told you, then that's what you do. And so what happened in the church is that there wasn't any scripture regarding these things. And so they're trying to figure out, well, who's right? Like jeans and slacks, like... <laughs> Remember that? <laughs> yeah. Shouldn't wear jeans in church. Show me in scripture where that's found. You can't. <laughs> It's not in there. But we made a whole generation of church out of should you wear jeans or slacks. And we spent years arguing about it while in the meantime we lost an entire generation of people going to hell because we were more concerned whether or not someone should wear jeans or not in church. That's what I'm talking about. And so scripture when clear, when, when scripture and God's law says this is what you should do or should not do, then that's what we do. But there's these areas then that we find of who's right and who's wrong. And Paul says, for some of you, this is okay. Your conscience doesn't say for you, you shouldn't. But if your conscience says you shouldn't do it, then you shouldn't do it. For me, for instance, one of the things that I came in my life was the music I listened to. 
the Spirit spoke to me that there was certain music that I shouldn't listen to. And that was something he spoke to me. Now, what if I took that and said, all of you shouldn't do it too? You know what the word that was termed for that? Legalism. Trying to get people to live a certain way that we don't find here so that we live a certain standard that only we give you. That's what the Pharisees did. That was my conviction. I can't make someone else also follow my conviction because I feel I'm not supposed to. You may feel just fine doing it. And that's okay. That's what Paul's saying. Accept one another because Jesus is the one that is going to speak to you whether you should or whether you should not. And if you feel it's okay, then do it. If you feel you shouldn't, then don't. And that's this, this image. Let me keep reading. In verse 5, in the same way, some think one day is more holy than the other day, while others think every day is alike. You should each be fully convinced that whichever day you choose is acceptable. And those who worship the Lord on a special day do it to honor Him. Those who eat any kind of food to do it to honor the Lord, since they give thanks to God before eating. And those who refuse to eat certain foods also want to please the Lord and give thanks to God. For we don't live for ourselves or die for ourselves. If we live, it's to honor the Lord. If we die, it's to honor the Lord. So whether we live or we die, we honor the it's a tough picture. It's a tough picture. So number one, let me give you three things that Paul gives us here of, of how do we embrace and understand this aspect of acceptance. But the first thing he tells us, and we just read it, do not judge others based on your own personal preferences. So we kind of get that, that sentence that you can fill in, that we make sometimes. So look like a Christian, you have to do this. You have to follow this, and it's not in here, though. It's, it's what you believe, it's what you grew up thinking, it's what you grew up following. Kevin and Patty are two good friends of Ours and, and grew up a Catholic background. So very different. Very different. And so how do we, you know, when they started coming here, how do we embrace those differences? We can't get caught up on those small differences and act like, oh, we just got to argue all day about, about these differences. No. Paul says, receive one another. Embrace each other. Should we have good conversations? Absolutely. But he says don't get into arguments that you begin to judge others based on your personal preferences of what you think should or should not be. Live according to what God's word has established. In other words, don't, don't get your opinion in the way of what Christ is trying to do somewhere. That can happen a lot. We don't care about people's opinions. We care about what Jesus says. And that may look different for other people. The second thing that, that, that Paul points out here, don't cause your brother to stumble. Look down at verse, uh, start at verse 13. Paul tells us, you each will give a personal account to God. So in other words, don't worry about judging each other, because guess what? Each of you are going to stand before God and have to give a personal account. We're not here to sit and be Jesus to people and say, oh, maybe you shouldn't have done it, maybe you should have done this. That's not what we're here to do. We're here to follow the Word. If it's in the Word, yes, we can judge. We'll talk about that in a couple of weeks in the final, in the final message. We can judge based on Scripture. We can judge based on what God has given. But but he says, don't, don't cause your brother. It says, stop condemning each other. Decide instead to live in such a way that you will not cause another believer to stumble or fall. I know and convinced on the authority of the Lord Jesus that no food in and it of itself is wrong to eat. But if someone believes it is wrong... 
then for that person it is wrong. And if another believer is distressed, I want you to see this word distressed, by what you eat, you are not acting in love if you eat it. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. I think that's a powerful line of scripture right there. So it may not be wrong for you. And Paul establishes that. But now, now what happens? Because we're talking about a social context. So there may be something that you do in private. But then when you do it in the social context, he says, what happens if you cause a brother to stumble while doing it? The biggest example that, that, that we can really think about uh, is, is if uh, a person that you know has some kind of addiction or, or some kind of hang-up, and, and so they get around you and they become a believer, and, 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 and they're trying to get away from, let's say, drinking or drugs, and then and then they and then they find you and and, and, and they hang out with you and, and you're sitting there drinking a beer and they're like, oh, all right. and all of a sudden they're thinking, well, I'm trying to get away from that, but then my brother and the Lord is drinking one too, so it must be okay. You have just now made your brother stumble. And the word that Paul uses, I want you to, to notice this word is the word distressed. If through your actions you are not providing a place of progress for people, but rather distress, and they are going back into the way that they were trying to get out of, you have made them fall and stumble. You know, stumbling, I'm walking and I'm walking, and then all of a sudden Susan throws something out in front of me and I fall over. That's what this is talking about. So you intentionally put something out there and cause someone to fall. That's what Paul's talking about. You know, but you still do it. That is what we should not do. So, so we're not accepting when we cause a brother or sister to stumble. And so in verse 15, this is the one I read to you. Don't let your eating ruin someone for whom Christ died. Jesus died for that person. Don't let your actions ruin them for what Jesus did in their life. Don't hurt that person. Be aware of what I'm doing around certain people. And then the third observation, look at verse 22. I'm going to jump on verses 22 and 23 real quick. It says, you may believe there's nothing wrong with what you are doing, but keep it between yourself and God. Blessed are those who don't feel guilty for doing something they have decided is right. But if you have doubts about whether or not you should eat something, you are sinning if you go ahead and do it. For you are not following your convictions. If you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. You know where convictions come through? Conscience. You know who speaks to the conscience? The Holy Spirit. So when the Holy Spirit speaks into, into your life and gives you a personal conviction about something you shouldn't do, to go against that is to sin. But also, to force somebody else to go against their conscience does not show this embracing or welcoming or accepting of the person. So if someone feels that it's all right that they do something, and you feel it's not all right, and you try to convince them and prove to them without Scripture that they shouldn't do that, you're hurting them. And this is what, what Jesus called legalism. It's what the Pharisees tried to do. The Pharisees tried to control in the religious and social system that everyone needs to do what we do. Because we say we need to do it. Let me read you a scripture. Mark. Mark chapter 7. Mark 7 verse 9, it says this. And he's speaking to these Pharisees and teachers and religious people. And he says, you skillfully, I love that. NLT says, you skillfully. 
I mean, these people were smart. The Pharisees, the teachers, they were smart. It says you skillfully sidestep God's law in order to hold on to your own traditions. Let me just say this. Traditions aren't bad. Traditions can be good. But the problem is when you make your tradition the same level as God's law. So that if someone doesn't follow your tradition, it's like they're breaking the law of God. And Jesus says, there's a problem with that. You are sidestepping what is the true word of God, and you're living and just tradition, trying to get other people to follow that. Interesting enough, and I'm not going to go too far into this, but I thought it was an interesting <coughs> observation. That's almost a description of a cult. When you get people into a group to go against their will and to form into an entirely different way of life and thinking against their will. It's a cult. I'm not saying it's what Jesus is saying here, but I thought it was interesting how we can teeter within the history of the church. And so when we look at a brother or sister, it may be wrong in your eyes, but if it's okay for them, figure out what do I need to do to embrace my brother or sister. Because we can cause such division in the body of believers when we try to get everyone to form to our way of thinking, our way of doing. But I believe there's a beauty in the body of Christ when diversity is allowed to be when we're allowed to be who God wants us to be, and to be the body, and to embrace each other, allowing the Holy Spirit to teach and to judge each person's thoughts and motives of what they should be doing. Second Corinthians five sixteen. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one time, we thought of Christ merely from a human point, how differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person, and the old life is gone, and the new life has come. Listen to that very first line. We have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. I always tell people, tell people, look at each other from an eternal point of view. As Jesus, when, when Jesus looked at people in his ministry, he looked at them from the point of view of heaven. That's why he broke down all these barriers. Because guess what? The Samaritans need the gospel. The lepers need the gospel. The sinners need the gospel. The tax collectors need the gospel. He always looked at relationships from the eternal perspective, not a human. Because if we only look at each other from a human point of view, you know what? We're going to be the most miserable people in the world. That's why church is different, because church, we're supposed to look at each other from an eternal point of view of what Christ sees us as, what Christ wants us to be as. So don't just look at each other merely. Look over. Jump, jump back, 1 Corinthians chapter. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at verse 5. I'm just giving you the, the three barriers into which we allow the embracing of the welcome. Legalism, favoritism, and, and then number three, Verse 5, so don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time before the Lord returns, for he will bring 
our darkest secrets to light, and reveal our private motives. Then God will give each of whatever praise is due. I grew up in a church, Methodist church that was pretty well to do people. I mean, the people I lived in town with, and kind of like you guys. My mom then took a church that was a mission affiliation with the Methodist church. And so then I began to see people that would show up and they were they were drunk, wobbling around, and they smelled like they hadn't showered in years, and, and, and their clothes had dangly holes and their hair looked like they hadn't been washed. And, and that was the people in the church. And all of a sudden I was like, I don't want to be around these people. I made a judgment about those people before even knowing who they were. You know what I found over time? Some of those people who we look down upon are some of the most incredible people that have some of the wisest thoughts that can change a life. And they fell into a position of life. Something happened, something went down. And so I grew up as a young boy in that context of people. And so what does Paul say? Don't make judgments about anyone ahead of time. Don't prejudge people. I thought this was a pretty cool uh, a gentleman from the Watertown Church. I don't know if you guys heard this story or not, but Micah told me a couple weeks ago we are sitting in church and all of a sudden hear this beeping. And we're all trying to figure out this is beeping, and he, they finally found out it was a, a woman who was on house arrest, and she had gone too far from her home, and she was sitting in church, and her ankle was it was beeping. <laughs> her old officer was probably going to go after her, but he said that was so cool that it happened in that church. Now we can begin to all think about and begin to judge what did she do, what, why did she do it, why did she get into it. Erase it. Look at her from Jesus. She needs to be here. Jesus loves her. She has a purpose of life. Welcome her. Accept her. Embrace her. Don't judge. Because you can blind yourself from seeing that person as Jesus is. And I've had to learn to do that in my ministry, to not prejudge people on first-time parents. So welcome and grace. Jesus did this in what way? Unconditionally. He embraced people unconditionally. This song that we're going to sing, I'm going to come out of it just simply says this everyone needs compassion, the kindness of the Savior. Everyone needs compassion, the kindness of the Savior. And for some people, they will only find that kindness when God's people show it. And so when they come to church, when, when you invite someone to church, and let's just say they show up, we want them to experience the kindness of the Savior. They may be a bill, they may show up and have no shoes on, and <laughs> they may have some tattoos and some piercings and who knows what, no hair, I don't know. But who are we to sit there and say, I don't know about that much. We're different. I'm different than you. You're different than me. I wouldn't want to be you. Hey, Amen. You wouldn't want to be me. But you know, that's a good thing. So Paul says, accept each other then. Accept each other as Jesus accepted you. For what? For the glory to Him. For the glory to Him. Father, our relationship with one another 